in this lecture we're going to be mainly looking at solids and liquids. There'll just be a little bit on gases at the beginning. We're going to be looking at heat capacity and latent heats. So this lecture is going to cover sections 19.4, 19.5 and 18.4 of your textbook. A lot of this stuff is also covered in your lab manual in the specific and latent heat lab. So last lecture we had a look at adiabatic processes. We said adiabatic processes are when in which no heat is transferred. So that means Q equals zero, which the first law of thermodynamics then becomes that the change in internal energy is equal to the work done. And we showed that in this case the equation PV to the gamma is constant applies. And gamma in this case is Cp over Cv where Cp is the specific heat of the gas at constant pressure and Cv is the specific heat of the gas at constant volume. Last lecture we also had a look at some of these definitions which you really need to know. So an isothermal process is one which happens at constant temperature. An example of an isothermal process is one which happens with very little insulation and very slowly. So in this case, whatever you're doing, it's constantly in thermal equilibrium with the surroundings and so the temperature is constant. The equations that apply in this case are PV is constant. That comes from the ideal gas law where NRT are constant and the change in internal energy is equal to zero as if there's no change in temperature, there is no change in the internal energy. Next we looked at what isobaric means. This just means constant pressure. So an example of something happening at constant pressure is anything that happens at atmospheric pressure. So any process that you carry out which is open to the atmosphere so that that pressure is always in equilibrium with atmospheric pressure is isobaric. And the ideal gas law tells us that in this case, T on V is constant. And we saw that the heat added in this case is given by N Cp delta T, where Cp is that molar specific heat at constant pressure. Finally, we considered the isovolumetric case. These are things that happen at constant volume. So the most common example of this is some process carried out within a fixed container or a sealed room so that the volume cannot change. The ideal gas law in this case tells us that P on T is constant. And because the volume is not changing, there is no work done. So work is equal to zero. And so the change in internal energy is equal to the heat added, which is given by NCV delta T. Okay, we're just going to look at a couple of things to do with gases and then move on to specific and latent heats. First of all, we're going to consider the mean free path. So the mean free path of a molecule is actually the average distance it transverses between collisions. So we've kind of been ignoring this a bit in the past, but it makes sense that as the density of a gas increases, the number of collisions of each molecule with other molecules is actually going to increase, and this is going to affect the motion a bit. So lambda represents the average distance that a molecule moves before it collides with another molecule. And this is given by 1 over the square root of 2 times pi d squared, where d here stands for the diameter of the molecules. n, this is the number of molecules that we have, and v, this is the volume of our gas. So let's have a look now at why this makes sense. We won't derive it exactly, but we will show why it has this type of relationship. Okay, so what we're going to be considering is molecules colliding. So to collide, we've got two molecules like this. They've both got diameter D. And they have to come such that their centers are within a distance D of each other. If that happens, then a collision has occurred. Now that's quite clear. We can actually model this a bit more easily, however, if we consider just our one moving molecule as having a diameter 2d and then we can consider the other molecules as stationary points. So this is um, a point and it's the other molecules. 
So we won't prove now that these are equivalent. If you like a bit of a challenge, then you can try showing this at home. So this is what actually happens. This is our equivalent model that we'll be using to simplify it. So let's consider a time interval delta t. So in a time interval delta t, our molecule travels a distance v delta t. And so we can imagine this is our molecule. It traces out a kind of cylinder like this. So this has got a radius d and it travels some distance v delta t. And however many of these points are inside this cylinder, those are the points or the molecules that it collides with. So in this time interval delta t, the volume of that cylinder is given by pi d squared. So this has got radius r, so the area of a circle is pi r squared, which is pi d squared in this case, times the length, which is v delta t. And so the number of points it collides with is just given by the density of the points. So the density of these points is given by the number of molecules divided by the volume. So this is given by n on v times pi d squared v delta t. And so that is how many it collides with in time delta t. And now And now lambda is just equal to the length of the path during delta t, so this length here, divided by the number of collisions. Because remember lambda is the average distance it travels between collisions. So the length of the path it travels is given by v delta t, we've shown that there, and the number of collisions is given by this here, n on v pi d squared times the velocity delta t. This v is the volume, this v is the velocity. So now we can make a number of simplifications, that delta t cancels that, that's the velocity there, this is the velocity here, so they cancel out. And so this is equal to 1 over n on v pi d squared. Now we made a big simplification here. We just assumed that these points were stationary, which they're not. So if you want a challenge, you can show that the relative velocity is equal to the square root of 2 times the average velocity. And this is where that root 2 comes from. So we actually end up with lambda equals 1 over root 2 pi d squared n on v, where d is the diameter of the molecules, n is the number of molecules in the volume v of the gas. And this is the average distance it travels between collisions. Now another thing that it's worth looking at is that we've been looking at the average speed of the particles of the gas. But it should be remembered that this is just the average speed. There's a whole range of speeds which the particles in the gas can be travelling at. So Maxwell actually came up with an equation for this. This is the molar speed distribution equation, and it shows the probability of a particle having a particular speed v. If we plot it, we end up getting a curve like this. So you can see there is a minimum to speed that they can have, but then there's not really a maximum speed, so there's a long tail here. So you can see on this graph we've got the root mean squared velocity is indicated by this line here. The average velocity is a little bit less, it's indicated by this line here. And then the most probable velocity is a little bit less than that even and is marked by this speed here. 
and as the temperature increases, so 300 kelvins is bigger than 80 kelvins, the peak of this distribution moves to higher speeds. So to work out the average speed, we just need to integrate between 0 and infinity of the speed, which is v, times this probability of it having a particular speed. So that's really a whole lot of maths. There's standard integrals that we can use to get this value out, and that ends up being the square root of 8rt divided by pi m. Now the root mean squared velocity is the square root of the average velocity squared, and so we can say that, well, the average velocity squared, that's just v squared times the probability of it having a particular v. So again, using standard integrals to solve that between 0 and infinity, we end up with 3rt on m, and so the root mean squared velocity is the square root of this thing here. And finally, the most probable speed, well, that occurs when dp dv is equal to 0. And so again, using maths, we can solve that to show that the most probable speed is equal to the square root of 2rt on m. So if you love maths, then have a go at solving these for yourselves. Otherwise, you can just take my word that if you use the standard integrals, this is what you get. So let's consider a problem now. In oxygen, which has a molar mass of 0 0.0320 kilograms per mole, and we're considering it at room temperature, 300 kelvins, what fraction of the molecules have speeds in the interval from 599 to 601 meters per second? Okay, so the fraction in range from 599 to 601 is the probability of it having the speed from 599 601 so that's PV dV divided by the total probability which is from 0 to infinity of PV dV and this just because if we sum up the probability of it having any speed that has to be 1 and so what we need to do now is work out what this is. Now because this is a very small range, so remember we've got a graph something like this and we're just doing a very small bit here, we can just do that this integral is approximately equal to delta v, so the dv, the range of speeds, that's this width here, times the average height, which is the height it would have at 600 meters per second. So this is just equal to p v. And so we just need to work out what this is. So this is equal to, well, delta v, the width of that is 2, 601 minus 599 is 2, times pv. And pv we were told was equal to 4 pi times m over 2 pi rt to the 3 on 2, v squared times e to the minus mv squared on 2rt. And so let's just work out what these things are. m over 2 pi rt, m we were told was 0 0.0320 divided by 2 pi times 8.314 and t was 300. So solving this one, we end up with 2.0419 times 10 to the minus 6. So m over 2 pi rt, to the 3 on 2 is equal to this to the 3 on 2 which is 2.92 times 10 to the minus 9 seconds cubed per meter cubed. And then let's work out what this term is. So mv squared over 2rt that is equal to 0 0.0320 times 600 squared over 2 times 8.314 times t, which is 300, so that is equal to 2.31, solving it on the calculator. So now we can just substitute everything back into this equation. So it is equal to 2 times 4 pi times this thing, which is the 2.92, times 10 to the minus 9, times v squared, which is 600 squared, times e, to the minus 2.31. And solving that on the calculator, we get 2.66 times 10 to the minus 3, which is equal to 0 0.266%.
Okay, so onto specific heats. We've seen before that specific heat is the amount of energy, usually in the form of heat, that needs to be added to raise one kilogram of a substance one degree C. So Q is equal to MC delta T is the form that's normally written in. C is different for different substances and it can be treated as a constant for a given substance as long as the change in temperature isn't too large. So this table presents the specific heats of some different substances. You can see for water it's very large, 4186. That is in fact the largest on this table. For metals it ranges from around about 900 for aluminium down to 129 for gold. And you can see that the specific heat for ice and for steam are different to the specific heat for water. Now we're lucky on Earth that the specific heat of water is so large, it's that large everywhere in the universe, but why we're lucky is it means that the ocean is able to absorb a lot of heat energy without changing its temperature very much. So this helps stabilise the Earth's climate. Over summer the ocean temperature does rise a little bit. If the specific heat of water was much lower, then the temperature of the oceans would rise a lot more over summer and we'd have much greater fluctuations in the temperature on Earth. So a question for you to try. Imagine you have one kilogram each of iron, glass and water and all three samples are at 10 degrees C. Rank the samples from highest to lowest temperature after 100 joules of energy is added to each sample. Okay, so we're adding the same amount of energy to each sample. The order of their specific heats is that water has the largest specific heat, glass is medium and iron is the lowest. So adding 100 joules will change iron's temperature by the most and then glass and then water. So iron will be the hottest after this energy has been added. Part B, rank the samples from greatest to least amount of energy transfer by heat if each sample is to increase its temperature by 20 degrees C. We have to add the most amount of heat to increase the temperature of water because it has the largest specific heat. So to increase the temperature by 20 degrees C, water will require the largest heat, then glass and then iron. Okay, now another question. The highest waterfall in the world is the Salto Angel Falls in Venezuela. Its longest fall has a height of 807 meters. If water at the top of the fall is 15 degrees C, what is the maximum temperature of water at the bottom of the falls? Okay, here's a big assumption. Assume all the kinetic energy of the water as it reaches the bottom goes into raising its temperature. Okay, so we're assuming that all the kinetic energy goes into raising its temperature. Well, the kinetic energy started off as gravitational potential energy. So we have MGH, which is equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom, which goes into raising its temperature, so that's equal to MCW delta T. Okay, now the masses will cancel off, and what we're trying to do is get this change in temperature. So the change in temperature is GH over CW, substituting in 9.8, we were told that this waterfall was 807 metres high. So that's 807 over 4186 is the heat capacity of water. Solving that on the calculator, we end up with 1.89 degrees C. So that's the change in temperature. Now it's gaining kinetic energy. So it's gaining energy, so its temperature will increase. So the final temperature is equal to the initial temperature plus this change in temperature which is 15.0 plus 1.89. So this gives us 15.9, sorry, 16.9 degrees C is the temperature at the bottom of the force. Now that was a pretty big assumption. There'll probably be a lot of energy lost as condensation and other things along the way. So at this point we should just mention the heat capacity Heat capacity is a lot less useful than the specific heat. So the heat capacity is just that the heat transferred is equal to the heat capacity times the change in temperature. So the heat capacity of an object is going to depend on its mass as well as the type of material. 
So the specific heat, little c, which is more useful, is the heat capacity per unit mass. So they're related by little c is equal to big C on m. Okay, let's try a problem. A combination of 0.250 kilograms of water at 20 degrees C, 0.4 kilograms of aluminum at 26 degrees C, and 0.1 kilograms of copper at 100 degrees C is mixed in an insulated container and allowed to come to thermal equilibrium. Ignore any energy transfer to or from the container. What is the final temperature of the mixture? Okay, so what we know is that we've got 0 0.250 kilograms of water at an initial temperature, 20 degrees. We've got 0 0.400 kilograms of aluminium at an initial temperature of 26 degrees and we've got 0 0.100 kilograms of copper at initial temperature of 100 degrees C and we're asked to calculate the final temperature. So we know that no heat is transferred into or out of the system. So the total heat transfer is equal to zero. So this is equal to the mass of the water times the heat capacity of the water times the change in temperature of the water, which is the final water temperature of the water minus the initial temperature of the water plus the mass of aluminium times the heat capacity of aluminium times the change in temperature of the aluminium which is the final temperature of the aluminium minus the initial temperature of the aluminium plus the mass of copper times heat capacity of copper times the change in temperature of the copper which is given by the final temperature minus the initial temperature of copper. Now what we know is that these final temperatures are all the same because at the end the system is in equilibrium. So we've got the final temperature outside of the mass of the water times the heat capacity of the water plus the mass of the aluminium times the heat capacity of the aluminium plus the mass of the copper times the heat capacity of the copper is equal to MWCWTI W plus mass of aluminium heat capacity of aluminium times the initial temperature of the aluminium plus mass of copper, heat capacity of copper times the initial temperature of the copper. And so what we can do is divide by this to get our final temperature. So what we do then is we just substitute in all our numbers. Let's give ourselves a bit more room with that to substitute in. So the final temperature is equal to the mass of the water, 0.250 times 4186 times the initial temperature which is 20 plus the mass of the aluminium 0 0.400 times heat capacity of aluminium which is 900 if we look it up times the initial temperature of the aluminium plus the mass of the copper which is 0 0.100 times the heat capacity of aluminium which is uh, copper sorry which is 387 times the initial temperature which is 100 over these things, so 200, 0.250 times 4186 plus 0 0.400 times 900 plus 0 0.100 times 387. Solving this on the calculator, we get 23.6 23 degrees. So we'd expect the final temperature to be somewhere between 20 degrees and 100 degrees C, which it is. It's fairly close to the heat capacity of water because, sorry, it's very close to the initial temperature of water because the heat capacity of water is so much higher than the heat capacity of the other things. So question, heat contains the temperature of an object. We've seen that and seen the formula for it. What else can heat do? Well, heat can also change the state of an object. So let's look at that in a bit more detail now. Latent heat. We've met this before as well. Latent heat is the energy that is needed for a substance to undergo a phase change or a change of state. During a phase change, the internal structure and energy of a material changes, but its temperature does not. So Q is equal to the change in mass times the latent heat. Now this is the change in mass of the phase that exists at the higher temperature. So if ice, for example, is melting, this is the change in the amount of water, the change in the mass of water that is present. So some problems for you to try from homework set 5, 1, 1, 2, one student should try 1 and 2, 
and 1131 students should try 1, 2 and 3. Okay, so this table presents some values for the latent heats. Notice that there's a latent heat of fusion, which is when we're changing from a liquid to a solid, and also a latent heat of vaporization, which is when we're changing from a liquid to a gas. So for water, it's 3.33 times 10 to the 5 to melt the ice, and 2.26 times 10 to the 6 to cause steam to form. Now some everyday examples where you'll be aware of latent heats is on a hot day you can add ice to your drink. The ice melts and as it melts it removes heat from the liquid surrounding it decreasing the temperature of your drink. So that's how ice cools down your drink. On a hot day you've also evolved to sweat a lot. Now this is because as the sweat for evaporates it removes heat from your body as it requires heat to transform that liquid sweat into steam. Now this graph shows what happens to, a, to ice as we add energy at a constant rate. So we start with ice at minus 30 degrees C. As we add energy, it initially goes into raising the temperature of the ice. So the energy has been added at a constant rate, so the temperature of the ice changes at a constant rate. Once it reaches zero degrees C we begin to melt the ice. So it stays at zero degrees C as as an ice and water mixture as the energy all goes into melting the ice. Once all the ice is melted the energy that then goes into raising the temperature of the water. So now all the ice is gone and we've only got water. So the temperature increases at a steady rate as we pump in the water. Now once it gets to 100 degrees C, we're assuming atmospheric conditions here, then the energy goes into changing the state again, so changing the water to steam. So that all happens at a constant temperature at 100 degrees C. Once we've added enough energy to change all the water into steam, the energy then goes into increasing the temperature of the steam. Okay, next we discuss superheating and cooling. This is a bit beyond the scope of the course, so this isn't really examinable, but it's very interesting. We've been saying that if we add enough energy, we can change the state of something. We actually require something else in addition to that. We need a disturbance or a nucleation site to start that phase change occurring. So a phase change needs a disturbance or a nucleation site to take place. Water heated in the microwave can get above 100 degrees C if it's kept very still. And then when it's removed, we're disturbing it. So it has enough energy to turn to steam and it will turn to steam very suddenly. This can cause very bad burns. So be careful heating water in the microwave because it can become superheated as there's no disturbance in it. If you add sugar or salt or something to the water, then there are nucleation sites. You don't have that perfect water structure, and so it's harder to superheat it in that case. Okay, it's also possible to supercool water. You can chill water down below zero degrees C, and then if you disturb it, it will suddenly change state and or become solid. Now, kind of example of this nucleation sites is when you add Mentos to Coke. In the lecture we had a look at a video, I'll let you look for a video on YouTube if you want to, but when you add Mentos to Coke, the surface of the Mentos has nucleation sites all of, over them, where the gas which is dissolved within the Coke can come out of the liquid and form a gas again. So adding Mentos to Coke makes the gas in the Coke come out very quickly and you end up with a kind of geyser effect which looks very impressive. So this question will require us to use all that information. How much energy is required to change a 40 gram ice cube from ice at minus 10 degrees C to steam at 110 degrees C? Okay, so the first thing we have to do is we have to raise temperature from minus 10 degrees C to zero degrees C. So the energy required for this is given by M times C, now this is the heat capacity of ice, times the change in temperature. 
So we've got 40 grams, so 40 times 10 to the minus 3. The heat capacity of ice, if we look it up, is 2,090. And then the change in temperature, it's going from, zero, from minus 10 to 0, so that's 10 degrees. Solving that on the calculator, we end up with 836 joules. Okay, so now we've got ice at 0 degrees C. Next, energy goes into melting the ice. So the energy required for that is Q is equal to ML. And so that's 40 grams of ice. And the latent heat of fusion for water is 3.33 times 10 to the 5. So solving that on the calculator, we end up with 13,000. 320 joules is required for this step. Next we have to raise the temperature from 0 degrees C to 100 degrees C. This is now all water. So Q is equal to MC water times the change in temperature which is equal to 40 times 10 to the minus 3 times 4186 times the change in temperature which is 100 degrees Solving this on the calculator, we end up with 16,744 joules. Okay, now it's at 100 degrees. So now the energy goes into changing its state. It, we're changing it from liquid water into gas. So Q, so change to gas. So Q is equal to M of vaporization in this case which is 40 times 10 to the minus 3 times 2.26 times 10 to the 6 so this on our calculator is 90,400 joules this is by far the biggest energy so far so we need a lot of energy to change from a liquid to a gas at least for water and then we have to change the temperature of the steam so raise temperature from 100 degrees C to 110 degrees C. So that's Q mass times the heat capacity of the steam times the change in temperature. So that is 40 times 10 to the minus 3. The heat capacity of steam is 2010 times the change in temperature, which is an increase of 10 degrees. Solving that, we end up with 804. Okay, so the total energy we just have to add this one, 836 plus 13,320 plus 16,744 plus 90,400 plus 804 joules gives us 122,104 joules, which we should really give to three significant figures. So that's 122 kilojoules of energy is required. Okay, so questions. Antifreeze is added to petrol in cold climates to stop the petrol freezing. How does it work? Okay, well, in this case, the antifreeze actually disrupts the crystal structure that the petrol tries to form as it freezes. So it decreases the freezing point of petrol. So what it effectively does is change the latent heat of fusion. It makes the latent heat of fusion higher so that we need to remove more energy from the petrol before it will form a solid and freeze. Another question. In a solar water heater, energy from the sun is gathered by water circulating through the tubes in the rooftop collector. The solar radiation enters the collector through a transparent cover and warms the water in the tubes. This water is pumped into a holding tank. Assume that the efficiency of the overall system is 20%, that is 80% of the incident solar radiation is lost from the system. What collector area is necessary to raise the temperature of 200 litres of water in the tank from 20 degrees C to 40 degrees C in one hour when the intensity of incident sunlight is 700 watts per meter. Okay, we're told for this system that the efficiency is 20%, which implies that only one-fifth of the power is actually used. So we will need five times as much power as we would if this was 100% efficient. Now we're told that the intensity of the sunlight falling on the roof is 700 watts per meter squared. So intensity is equal to 
the power over the area. So this tells us that the power collected by the solar collector is equal to 700 times the area in meters squared of our collector. Now power is energy over time and in this case the energy is being used as heat. So we've got that the power is equal to Q over T. Okay, so let's substitute in everything we know. We know that the power is 700 times the area. We know that we need five times as much heat because of the inefficiencies as we would otherwise. So we've got five times. Now Q is equal to M, the mass of the water, which is 200 litres, so 200 kilograms, times the heat capacity of water, 4,186, times the change in temperature. And we're trying to raise it from 20 degrees to 40 degrees, so that's 20 degrees C is the change in temperature there. And then the time, we were told that this was to happen in one hour, so that's 60 minutes and 60 seconds. Okay, so now we've got everything substituted in and we can work out the area. So the area is equal to 33 meters squared. Next question. In an insulated vessel, 250 grams of ice at 0 degrees C is added to 600 grams of water at 18 degrees C. Part A, what is the final temperature of the system? And part B, how much ice remains when the system reaches equilibrium? Okay, in questions like this, we need to use a little bit of trial and error. Let's assume that not all the ice melts, so the water ends up at zero degrees C. Let's calculate how much energy the water can give to the ice if the water cools from 18 degrees C to zero degrees C. So assume water goes to zero degrees C. Then Q is equal to MCW delta T which is equal to, we've got 600 grams of water, so 0 0.600 times 4,186 times the change in temperature, which is 18. So this gives us 45.1 kilojoules. So we divide this by 1,000 to get it into kilojoules of energy released. Okay. Now let's see how much energy we need to melt all the ice. Okay, so Q is equal to ML. This will be L of fusion. So we've got 250 grams of ice. So that's 0 0.250 times 3.33 times 10 to the 5. And so this gives us 83,000, so 83.2 kilojoules is required. Okay, so we require more energy to melt the ice than we can actually get from cooling this water. So that tells us that not all the ice melts. So at the end, we have water and ice in thermal equilibrium. So our answer to A is 0 degrees C. Okay, now part B said how much ice remains. We can work out how much ice melted because this energy, the energy is the water cools from, zero degree, from 18 degrees C to 0 degrees C, it can go into melting the ice. So 45.1 times 10 to the 3 is equal to the mass of the ice that melts times the latent heat of fusion, so times 3.33 times 10 to the 5. So the change in the mass, or the mass of the ice that melts, is equal to 0 0.13556 kilograms, or 136 grams. So this is the amount of ice that melted. So the mass of ice remaining is the 250 grams minus the 136 grams that melted. So that gives us 114 grams of ice remaining. Okay, next question. Calculate the specific heat of a metal from the following data. 
A container made of metal has a mass of 3.6 kilograms and contains 14 kilograms of water. A 1.8 kilogram piece of metal initially at a temperature of 180 degrees C is dropped into the water. The container and water initially have a temperature of 16 degrees C and the final temperature of the entire insulated system is 18 degrees C. Okay, so we're trying to get this specific heat for the metal. Okay, so let's draw a diagram. We've got a container. Here's our container. The mass is equal to 3.6 kilograms. It's filled with 14 kilograms of water. So this has got C of water, which is 4,186. This is made of the metal, so it's got C of metal. And this is all at an initial temperature of 16.0 degrees C. We then add a hot lump of metal. So this is the same metal, it's got the heat capacity of metal. The mass of this metal is 1.8 kilograms and the initial temperature is 180 degrees C. So we put this in here, eventually they come to thermal equilibrium So they're all at the same final temperature. And we're told that that final temperature is equal to 18.0 degrees C. Okay, and we need to now work out what this heat capacity of the metal is. So the energy lost by the hot metal is equal to the energy gained by the container plus water. Okay, now I just need to put a little negative sign there as lost energy is going to be negative, so we'll need our negatives to cancel out. Okay, so how much energy is this hunk of metal losing? Well, it's losing the mass of the rod times the heat capacity of metal times the change in temperature, which is temperature final minus temperature initial for this rod. And this is equal to the energy gained by the container and water, which is the mass of the water, heat capacity of water, times the Tf minus Ti of water. So these initial temperatures are different, plus the mass of the container, heat capacity of metal, Tf minus Ti. Okay, now what we're trying to do is solve for this Cm. Everything else is actually known. So let's just do some algebra. Let's pull Cm out as a common factor. We'll move this term across to here. So this can be written as Mr. And we can write this as T initial of rod minus Tf. Just putting that negative sign inside. And then minus, this is mass of the container times the change in temperature of the container is equal to mass of water, heat capacity of water times the change in temperature of the water. Okay, let's just substitute everything in now and divide. So Cm is equal to the mass of water, we've got 14 kilograms with a heat capacity 4,186 and the final temperature is 18, the initial temperature is 16. Now we're dividing by this. The rod, the hunk of metal, has a mass of 1.8 it's going from its initial temperature of 180 down to 18. And then we've got this container, which is 3.6 kilograms. The final temperature is 18 and the initial temperature is 16. Okay, solving that on the calculator, we end up with 412 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. And that is the right order of magnitude for the heat capacity for a metal. Okay, and finally a revision question, just because some of the topics we've covered before have been very difficult. So when 20.9 joules was added as heat to a particular ideal gas, the volume of the gas changed from 50 centimetres cubed to 100 centimetres cubed, while the pressure remained at 1.00 atmospheres. So this is a constant pressure process. A, by how much did the internal energy of the gas change? And then if the quantity of gas present was 2.00 times 10 to the minus 3 moles, find B, 
the specific heat at constant pressure, Cp, and C, we need to find Cv, specific heat at constant volume. Okay, let's just sketch our PV graph. That's always a good way to start. This is a constant pressure process, 1.00 atmospheres. Now, the volume was going from 50 centimetres cubed up to 100 centimetres cubed. And we were told that heat energy was added Q was equal to 20.9 joules and we were asked what's the change in internal energy equal to. Well the easiest way to do this is to, we have the heat here, Q is equal to 20.9. We can work out the work as the area under this curve. So work is equal to minus the integral of P dot dV. It will be negative as it is expanding, so the gas is doing the work, so this is minus. The pressure is 1 atmosphere, so 1.01 .01 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And the change in volume is from 50 to 100, so that's 50 centimetres cubed. So 50, and now 1 centimetre cubed is 1 litre. So we'd have to time, uh, 1 millilitre, sorry. So we'd have to times it by 10 to the minus 3 if we wanted to get it into litres. And then into metres cubed, we times it by 10 to the minus 3 again. So solving that on the calculator, we end up with minus 5.05 joules. Okay, so now we can just use our first law of thermodynamics, change the internal energy is Q plus W. So that's 20.9 minus 5.05, which gives us 15.9 joules of energy is added as internal energy. Okay, so that's the answer to part A. Part B said that N was equal to 2.0 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. And we were asked to find Cp. And we know that for a constant pressure process, which is what we have here, Q is equal to N Cp delta T. Okay, so we're trying to find this. We know Q, we know how much heat was added, we're told up here. And so now what we need to do is work out the change in temperature. Now this is an ideal gas. So the change in temperature, we have PV is equal to NRT, constant, constant, our pressure is constant. So our change in temperature is proportional to the change in volume. So the change in temperature will be the change in the volume times the pressure over NR. Substituting in, our pressure is 1.01 .01 times 10 to the 5. Our change in volume is 50 times 10 to the minus 6 metres cubed. That's what we worked out down here. The number of moles is 2 point, this should be 2.00, 2.00 times 10 to the minus 3 times R, 8.314. Solving that, we end up with 303.7. Okay, so now we've got everything. Cp is equal to Q over N delta T, which is 20.9 over 2.00 times 10 to the minus 3 times the change in temperature, 303.7. Solving that on the calculator, we end up with Cp is equal to 34.4, and the units are joules per mole per kelvin. Okay, and finally, part C, we were asked for Cv. The easiest way to do this is to realise that Cv is equal to Cp minus R. So all we need to do is take off R from this, which is 8.314. 34.4 minus 8.314 gives us 26.1 joules per mole per Kelvin. So that's the answer to part C. So we've made a bit of a mess of that. Okay, and that's the end of this lecture.